Learning Jungle on Main Street, formerly Main Street School Supply, is located in downtown Cambridge just west of the courthouse on Wheeling Avenue. They have a huge location full of educational resources and toys that teach, as well as entertain. They feature a large inventory of gifts for children of all ages, and you just have to check out their selection of stuffed animals, puppets, games, and much more. The Learning Jungle on Main Street, downtown Cambridge, has layaway for your convenience and is the area's only specialty toy store. A world of knowledge is waiting for you at their front door. Um, I, I want to welcome you all back to um, what we used to have, uh, Energy Coalition, and we're now calling Coffee and Commerce. Um, and, and thanks for all of you to, to come this morning. Um, as I mentioned in my email, uh, the last eight, 18 months have, have kind of gotten us into a slump, and, and we haven't had a lot of um, inspiration, I, I'll say, um, speakers to come and, and kind of talk and, and give us good news about the gas and oil industry. But I think we're seeing a turn in the right direction for that. A um, lot more discussion going on, a lot more um, positive outcomes being projected. And so we want to make sure that we bring that information to you. Um, I also want to thank Southgate Hotel because they continue to allow us to use this facility every month at no fee. And they make the coffee and get everything set up. How Craig Insurance also sponsored this morning by provi providing the pastries for you. Um, and the Learning Jungle is the sponsor for the recording of this and playing on local television the following two weeks after this meeting. So we want to recognize those sponsors and thank them very much for doing that. So um, without further ado, um, you know, we always go to the Ohio Oil and Gas Association to get our, our best information. And so we go there again today. And Mike Chadsey and David Hill from UGA are here to present where are we, where are we going, and how are we going to get there? And I think we're all interested in seeing that. So are you first up, Mike? So I'll introduce Mike Chadsey. Please welcome him. Thank you, Joe. Where are we, where are we going, and how the heck do we get there? If anybody knows, please, please update us after the meeting. <laughs> So just quickly jump around in. Many of you know who we are and what we do, but for those of you who are new in the room, I do see some new faces. Uh, Dave Hill serves as the president of the Ohio and Gas Association. I'm on staff. I'm the director of public relations. We're a typical trade organization. We have uh, around 3,000 members, half individually, half corporately, and we're the voice of the oil and gas industry to media, elected officials, and community members like yourself. And before I get much more into that, for the folks that are new, I want to give a real quick technical explanation of where oil and gas really came from. Uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> With that, we'll jump right back in and take it seriously. So many of you have seen this chart over the weeks and months and years, but quickly want to bring everybody up to speed as a quick snapshot as to where we are as far as development. You see the permitted drilled and producing numbers and of course the rigs that are currently operating in Ohio. Let me put some quick perspective around that. We see 17 rigs. We used to, at our one point at our high upwards of two years ago, had 59. So clearly there has been a slowdown. But the other thing that we need to talk about is the efficiency that many of the drillers have put in place. The longer you're here, the better you're going to understand the topography and the geology and the different formations that you're going to be dealing with. And so I think there's been some efficiency that folks have come through just natural time. And then, of course, the first list on the left of the 10 most active counties traditionally really became a seven-county play. And then when the prices collapsed, really became a three-county play. And in those three counties of Old Belmont, Monroe, and Harrison, there's only really a few townships that are very active right now. At one point, the Utica was so attractive because we had wet gas. But now, because of the price, it takes more to process it and ship it than it does that you can get for it. So really, many of our producers have retracted to the, uh, the driest gas uh, part of the window, which is, again, along the Pennsylvania border. But and then you see the list on the right. You see the most active companies. Many of them are certainly active here in Guernsey County and the Guernsey County area. And we will see that continue. And the hope is that our operators can figure out how to get west of 77 into the oil window, which will, Dave will explain here in a little bit. 
So bringing up to speed on some of the pipeline investment, uh, I see some of our friends from the organized labor, our friends from the laborers, they do great, great work on our pipelines and so many of our other projects, and we're proud to have that relationship with them because one of the things that we like to talk about is our safety record. And we can talk about our safety record because the folks like the laborers who do such a great job on all of our projects, they do it right the first time. So the list on the left are some of our favorite pipelines we talk about. There are a lot more projects, but these are some of the big ones. And then you can see the actual name of the projects. The ones that are in the press a lot lately are Rover and Nexus because they're several hundred miles and they're going through parts of northern Ohio that maybe haven't had as much experience or history in oil and gas like Cambridge and Guernsey County. You add them all up, you're talking about several billion dollars of investment. Right now, you're looking at most of them that are still pending, although there is some construction happening and some early work on some of the lines. These are going to be great because what it's going to do is help solve our price issue. We can get this gas to market, particularly in places like Chicago and Minneapolis and really anywhere west because the Pennsylvania Marcellus Shale is so prolific, you can't really get east. You have to go west into the south. Right now, we're producing more gas than we use, so we have to find new and bigger markets for that abroad, but also here locally, there's an effort to try to find some more end users of, of gas here. The other thing that's really happening, and we'll experience this here in Guernsey County, is, is the kind of the big switch. You know, right now we are traditionally and historically powered by coal. That is starting to change. A lot of that is because of price. Some of that is because of federal regulations. Some of that is just, just market forces. And so what's happening is there's a lot of coal coming offline, and Appalachia certainly is no stranger to that, but it's also impacting other parts of the country. And so what's happening is, again, the term called the big switch. We're getting off of coal, and we're getting onto natural gas for power generation. And why that's happening is that you've got six or seven different natural gas-fired power plants that are being permitted and constructed all over eastern Ohio. One of them is certainly being considered here in Guernsey County. The ones that are going to see online first are up in Carroll County. That's well on its way. The one up in Oregon is also uh, almost completed as well, too. So you're seeing these huge projects. Again, several uh, million dollars up to over a billion. What we're seeing is upwards of 6,000 megawatts being put on the grid to replace that coal that's coming offline, as well as the construction jobs. You're seeing roughly 4,000 construction jobs that are involved in basically moving the dirt and facilitating these projects. A lot of them are engineers, both mechanical and electrical. So that's bringing a lot of other new trades in. And you can kind of see on the column on the far right the actual status of these projects. Several of them are certainly pending as well as under construction. Hopefully we'll see some of these in the movement uh, completed here in the not too distant future. The other thing that's happening, you've probably read about, it, but for those that have haven't, ethane crackers, basically taking a part of natural gas, ethane, and turning it into other things plastic pellets, pharmaceuticals, fertilizers, things of that nature. And so, on the again, the list on the left, there's some of the companies and then the uh, locations. We already got the go-ahead from Shell over in Manaka, PA. That's really great news. What we're also seeing is the folks that are called PTT Global Chemical are considering their one in Belmont County. They've committed $100 million in upfront engineering for that project. Everything that we're hearing and we're reading is trending in the right direction. We look for a final decision from them, maybe late this year, early next year. Then there's other two have been announced. Uh, the one down in Wood County, there was originally a company called Ojebrek, a Brazilian company that was involved. The top CEO and some of his lieutenants are in jail for political corruption in Brazil. That doesn't probably mean it's gonna get built anytime soon. But there's another company called Braschem that kind of has stepped in and has been involved in that project and has been the new leader. Somewhat unlikely, but not completely off the table that that project's going to move forward. Then the last one is Appalachian Residence, which is always kind of classified as a mini cracker. They've got some finance issues and rumored to have some site issues as well, too. So that one doesn't look like it's happening. But at least one, potentially two, and what these are going to do are be huge end users of gas, as well as spur additional manufacturing up and down the Mid-Ohio Valley for those plastic pellets that can basically turn that into everything that you see in this room here today. So you're talking six, 5,000 jobs of construction and several hundred operational jobs once those things get up and running. But it does take once permitted four or five years of construction to actually get the project up and running. 
but a little bit more about the actual ethane chain. So part of natural gas is ethane, you take it to a cracker, you superheat it, and basically you can turn it into all these other products. So what you have is the opportunity to build these facilities that make these products here in the area. So it spurs off all their uh, investment and economic activity. And this is just a visual image. I think you've seen the folks from UGIP use this in the past. So basically every product that is really com com comfort to us is a product of natural gas and crude oil. So as we're terming it, welcome to the new Ohio. You see drilling in southeast Ohio. You see various uh, pipelines, mostly through northern Ohio, but certainly through southern Ohio well to get down to the Gulf Coast. And then the blue light bulbs are some of the key areas that we've seen the talk of the natural gas fired power plants. So even though we're drilling uh, and directly impacting southeast Ohio, we're having in, uh, indirect and induced economic activity all over the state of Ohio. So the, one of the big reasons why we wanted to come out here today is not only catch you up on some of the activity that's happening in the state of Ohio, but also talk about the University of Cincinnati. Sounds kind of strange, but I have a reason for that. They have uh, conducted a, a couple of studies. We've been following the one they did up in Carroll County. They did a groundwater study, really the first of its kind across the country, where they were able to do pre-drilling, during drilling and post drilling water testing in and around Carroll, Columbiana counties. Uh, as you see there, it took about 28 months. They had 194 samples in five counties. And what did it say? All the samples fell within the clean water range. That's the most important piece. They never saw a significant increase in methane concentrations. Samples that were collected that actually had high methane did not have, did not have natural gas as its source. And lastly, some of the highest concentrations of methane we're not near a well at all. That's all great news. Now you take that and you add that to what the US EPA did on their five-year groundwater study that said there was no widespread systematic impacts from oil and gas development. Great news, right? You think they'd be shouting that from the mountaintops. What they did is they went to a group called the Carroll County Concerned Citizens, a well-known anti-fracking group. It was a Thursday night, it was snowing, and they had a bunch of people out, and the professor uh, came out and gave this study announcement. We thought oh, we were there, we had a chance to engage and ask a couple questions. We started to look for headlines in the paper the next few days, only saw one. And then we contacted Cincinnati, and basically they said, oh, we've ran out of money, we're not able to pub publish it. Mm. Well, gee, that sounds suspect. Why did you run out of money? Thanks, Todd. <laughs> Welcome, by the way. Yeah, you're gl glad you're here. Why did you run out of money? Well, the funders that gave us the money for this study uh, didn't like the results. They were disappointed. What they wanted was the finest study that proved that oil and gas impacted the environment. And when we dug into that a little bit, we found out that there were a couple of foundations. One of them was from Cincinnati that had been given thousands and thousands of dollars to anti-fracking groups all over the country. So even though they were disappointed that the results, we were very happy with them. But those are still not published. And then University of Cincinnati continued. Now they did an air study, 12 months, 23 sites, again, in and around Carroll County. And what they did was looking for something called PAH levels. They're basically tied to cancer risk. So what they were suggesting is that even though the water was clean, oil and gas must be impacting the air. So they did a study. Again, they worked with the Carroll County Concerned Citizens. They went and, and trained them, and they went out and conducted this air study. And the problems with this study were uh, they were rec recruited and basically trained anti-fracking activists. They admitted they had a small sample size. They did not use random testing. Uh, they did not account for, and this is key, PHA levels that were impacted by coal or wood burning. They used worst case scenarios. They assumed you lived in your home for 25 years, 24 seven, and never left. What happened was that they found impact to air from oil and gas. Now naturally on this one, they didn't run out enough money they went and published the study. It turns out though, the study was later retracted about three months later because, and I'll give them credit for this, they had an honest calculation error in their spreadsheet. I can only imagine the amount of data on that spreadsheet they were working with. So what they did is they retracted the study, fixed their calculation error, and then republished the study. And basically what it came up with was, this work suggests that natural gas extraction is contributing to PAH levels in the air, but levels that would not be expected to increase cancer risk. So what had happened was they exaggerated the number by 725,000%. Missed it by that much. <laughs> but in fairness, 
they admitted the error, they retracted it, they republished it. So what we have from Cincinnati, which is a well-renowned geology program, is a groundwater study that showed no impact, an air study that showed no impact. And now what they're doing is they're gonna take their air study and they're gonna take it down here to Guernsey County. They've got some new dollars, some from federal government, some from outside resources, to continue to study the air um, as impacted by oil and gas. So. What's been interesting though, is they have um, certainly had a lot of folks following their study. We're certainly one of them, but the other one is the U.S. Chamber, and they have taken them to task pretty aggressively because the U.S. Chamber not only represents oil and gas, but all business. And so they have had a couple articles out, they certainly read a couple blogs, and um, they have accused them, the University of Cincinnati, for having a, a really a, an anti-fracking bias problem. Because when you put together, well, we ran out of money on the one, we jumped too quickly on the other one. What's the story, Cincinnati? And now they went out and got federal dollars to conduct another one. There's a trust issue there, and I think that's one of the things that we wanted to bring to everybody's attention today is, what's the real motivation behind the University of Cincinnati? Uh, are you bad at math or are you anti-fracking? And so we're gonna continue to ask those questions. We're gonna continue to hold them accountable for that. So with that, uh, my part is done. I'd like to bring up Dave Hill to finish out the presentation, talk a little bit about more of what we can expect uh, in the future from oil and gas. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is David Hill. I'm a uh, local oil and gas producer. I also operate class two injection wells in, in Guernsey County, uh, currently serving as president of the association. I also uh, represent Ohio at the uh, National Association, IPAA, Independent Petroleum Association of America. So Mike and I have been doing these presentations, bringing people up to date. As he said, we've been in somewhat of a lull. Things appear to be getting somewhat better. So we thought we'd like to come out and give everybody an update. And so we're going to talk my part of this, and we're going to talk a little bit about injection wells. We're going to talk about water usage. We're going to talk about um, the cuttings, the grindings, and what we're, what we're doing with those. In, um, uh, so, the class two injection wells. Class two, and this is uh, from, the Ohio, or from the US EPA, class two injection wells provide a safe, reliable, environmentally sound disposal of wastewater generated from oil and gas production and operations. Oftentimes you hear that it's not regulated. It's not regulated. Well, indeed, it is regulated. It's regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974. In 1984, the state of Ohio was able to go to the US EPA and say, we have a program, we think we can do this, and our standards will either meet or exceed the federal standards. So Ohio indeed um, approved to the federal government that they could do that, and so we got primacy. That means that the Ohio Department of Natural Resources directly regulates class two injection wells, but ultimately we're regulated by US EPA. Oftentimes you hear, why in the world does Ohio have to be the dumping ground for everybody and why do we have to do this? Well, in the United States of America, there are over 144,000 class two injection wells. Ohio currently has about 210 injection wells that are currently operating in the state. 40 states in the nation have went to the US EPA and said, we have standards that will either meet or exceed your standards and they either have primacy or they share primacy. And so again, going back to the, why, the dumping ground issue, volumetrically in Ohio, think about this, volumetrically in Ohio, we inject one half of 1% of all the water that goes back into the ground uh, in this country, one half of 1%. In 2014, Ohio injected 25 million barrels. That's, that's an annual total, 25 million barrels. In 15, it was 27. I rather suspect that 16 will be around 27 and probably uh, 17 it will start to decline until we get more rigs back in the air and continue drilling. Nationally, we inject 50 million barrels a day. So we're doing 25,000 uh, or 25 million a year here. We're putting 50 million away all across the United States. Again, one half of 1%. There's just a lot of misperception about class two injection wells and it's uh, it's a real issue that's important to me because I don't like uh, misinformation about my industry, our industry. So this is a schematic of a class two injection well. This happens to be a well I drilled in Belmont County. Um, 
It ended up being the deepest well in the state at over 13,000 feet. There are some people in this room that helped me with this well. But I wanted to show you the level of redundancy and what has to fail before you would have a failure at a class two injection well. So each one of these black lines is a string of casing, steel casing. And so in this particular well, we have one, two, three, four, five strings of casing, and then we have an injection string. So for this well to fail and somehow contaminate the fresh water, you would have to have a failure of the injection string and a failure of five different layers of casing. In addition to that, these gray areas represent cement. So you have to have a, a casing failure, failure of the cement, and on and on. I contend that there's, there's more redundancy built into these class two injection wells in this aspect than the airline industry builds into some, many of their systems. There's several layers of redundancy here. This is a cutout so you can visually see what I'm talking about. Now this particular uh, example has the injection string and then three layers of casing, but you can see the thickness of the pipe. You have to have failure of the casing, failure of these cements all across the uh, cross section of the well. I think that gives you a very good visual picture of what we're actually doing at a class two injection well and how we're protecting and preserving the uh, groundwater. This is a um, typical injection well wellhead. It's about the size of a single car garage. You can see we have fencing around it. The farmers um, run their cattle right up next to it. You see some uh, gauges on top. We're monitoring the pressure. The uh, solar panels, we're sending telemetry. We're sending real-time information about the pressures of these wells on the casing string and on the tubing stream back to my office to have a permanent record. And if anyone would ever question that we were overpressuring our well, we have records to prove that we indeed did not do that. This is the unloading pad, and you, you would say, well, why, you know, why would, would you folks be interested in the unloading pad? Well, it's because every aspect of a class two injection well is regulated and has to have the approval of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So if you notice, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but the unloading pad slants to the right. We have drainage uh, areas here. We've got berms on the side. So if there's any spillage as they're unloading uh, the water, it, it runs down to these drains, which is caught, and then it is pumped back up into the holding tanks. It's all done under the direction of the Department of Natural Resources. These are uh, two trucks unloading the brine. Um, several aspects uh, to this, you can't see it, but they have a grounding wire. They're grounding the truck to the earth so that we, it prohibits any chance of static electricity of causing a fire. Notice the guys have on FR clothing and their uh, hard hats. Oftentimes you hear about they're tearing up the roads, or it's really hard on the roads. Well, these are, and there's some people in here that can speak to this a lot much better than me, but there are these cheater axles so that it, it takes much of the strain off of the, uh, off of our highways. This is um, inside the pump house. These are the injection pumps that takes the water from the tanks, and uh, we uh, then use these pumps to inject it down the well. Notice all the gauges on the back. One of the things that the, the Department of Natural Resources does, they have a wonderful geology and engineering department up there, and they say if you inject it at pressures at X or lower, um, you reduce or diminish or eliminate the, any chance of induced seismicity. So it's very important that on these injection wells that we maintain a, uh, a lower pressure. And so what we're doing here, again, we've got telemetry, we're monitoring these pressures, and then we also have automatic shutdowns. So I don't have to have an attendant there monitoring those pressures. If it hits a predetermined pressure, everything shuts down automatically. And you can't see it here, but we also have floor drains. So if there would be any leakage or seepage in any of these pumps, there's a floor drain which goes over to a sump and then gets put back into the tanks and ultimately gets disposed and goes back down into the ground at 7,000 feet. So if there's any attorneys in the room, this technically isn't a chain of custody, but that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Every oil and gas well facility has what's called an API number, American Petroleum Institute number and permit. Every well has that. Every water truck that you've seen in that previous slide has a UIC number, a underground injection control num uh, permit and bond with the state of Ohio. And then 
the ultimate disposal of these of the of the water goes into a class two injection well and they also have permit numbers and we have to be bonded so what it does every load of water that comes in they the driver has to fill out a piece of paper and says it came from this well it was hauled by this trucking company and it was injected in this particular well and then the, the driver has to sign it and the attendant at the class two injection well also has to assign it so it's a cradle to grave uh, following of that water so to speak they have to put the time they pick the water up and the time they disposed of it so if there's an inordinate amount of time between pickup and and delivery you can start to investigate and work your way back on what might have happened if something uh, wasn't right with that uh, load of water. So again, this was behind the pumps. These are the automatic shutdowns. The state of Ohio says don't exceed, in my case, 1,600 pounds. These are set at about uh, 1,550 pounds so that if the injection pressure ever got too high, it would shut down automatically. And then again, the telemetry, we're reporting all of this stuff back to our office, keeping a permanent record and for ODNR to look at and inspect any time they want. The other thing you should know is that the oil and gas inspectors have the right to come on site anytime. They, they, they come unannounced, and quite frankly, we like it when they're there. It just gives our facility more credibility, but they can come at any time, day or night, uh, to inspect our operations. So let's talk about the secondary containment. So when the drivers unload their trucks, they go into these steel 200-barrel uh, tanks. They're all hooked up in a series. And then notice the berm around the edge. Well, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources designed and told me how to make this berm. And it's designed so that if every one of those tanks were full and every one of them had a catastrophic failure and failed all at once, this con secondary containment is enough to hold one and a half times all of the water in, if, in all those tanks. So let's talk a little bit about the water. A few uh, years ago, there were some people around here running around saying that we're going to use up all of the fresh water. We're going to have a shortage of fresh water because of hydraulic, hydraulic fracturing. So we've all lived around here. Most of us lived around here a long time, and we're familiar with how they draw. MWCD draws down the lakes um, during the year. So at Seneca Lake, Clendenning, and Piedmont, in one winter, the release of the drawdown is equal to 12 billion gallons. It goes into Wills Creek or whatever creek, gets into the Muskingum River, the Ohio River ultimately goes down into the Mississippi and then the Gulf of Mexico. So let's put that in perspective. One winter drawdown, that is enough to hydraulically fracture 2,400 wells and that's about what we've drilled so far in the Utica in Ohio so far. Just putting that into perspective. The other thing you should know about that, and you have to think back to your high school chemistry days, is that um, natural gas is methane, which is CH4, and when you burn methane, you combine it with oxygen. That chemical process, the byproduct of the combustion is carbon dioxide, CO2, water, and heat. And so you think about that. Think back, uh, you know, in the wintertime, if you've got a gas stove and the house is closed up and you're doing a lot of cooking, you get condensation on the windows inside of your house. That's because you've increased the humidity in your home because you've created water vapor. So most of these wells will produce um, at least one BCF of gas. In its lifetime, a horizontal Utica well uh, will produce over a BCF. Well, it takes about 10 million gallons um, to frack a well, and if, you, and if you produce a BCF, you get about 11, or 11 million gallons back. So there is, there is no loss of water because of uh, the hydraulic fracturing. You're putting it back in because of the combustion process of burning the natural gas. So now let's talk a little bit about pricing and what, what's happened with, with pricing. If you look back, remember the recession of 2008 at the end of the Bush administration? The economy had collapsed, the oil and gas industry, we were in another one of our uh, collapses, not nearly as bad as the one we're in right now. But we started out at, you know, $40, and we all remember these days, you know, 11 through about the, uh, 14, 
we were well north of $100. At times we got, we approached 100, or, yeah, $130 a barrel. And then if you notice right here at the end of uh, 2014, November 14, actually it was Thanksgiving Day. I remember sitting at, the, at home Thanksgiving Day. I knew OPEC was meeting. Many of us suspected that this was going to happen. They decided that they were going to defend market share and flood the market. And indeed they did because they want to, they want to um, eliminate their competition. They've seen the shale development, not in here in Ohio, but all across the United States. This was digging into their market share. They didn't like that. They wanted to defend it. One way to defend that is uh, they have cheaper lifting costs than we do. So they flooded the market. And they, inevitably, they drove the price down at the end of 14. You know, we're about $45. But man, we, we thought we could learn how to live here at $45 a barrel. And then in early of this year, they decided we haven't uh, had enough pain and they took it down even further. At one point in February, we were down to $26, $26 per barrel. And it gets worse for Utica shale people because the Utica oil um, has a high AP gravity, it's very thin, and um, we get about a $6 deficit to what you see. What you see is called WTI, West Texas Intermediate. We were actually getting about $6 less than that for our Utica oil, so we were down into the $19 to $20 range in February of this year. Extremely painful. Extremely, I mean, think about it in your own home. You get a, um, like a five-fold cut in your take-home pay, and your mortgage payments, the uh, respect still charges the same, makes it tough. Very, very difficult to operate under these conditions. So natural gas production since uh, 2012, if you use 2012 as the baseline, you can see how much we've uh, ramped up production, 20 BCF a day. And, and look, look, look at the two workhorses. The Utica is starting to be the workhorse, but look at the Marcellus over in uh, uh, western Pennsylvania and West Virginia. You know, uh, we go around and we talk to different communities, and we were talking to the people at Youngstown, and they were lamenting that, man, man you know, the, the Utica shale isn't going to work for us. We're a little too far west for the Marcellus shale. But what I told them was, you know, when I think of, when I think of the Mahoning Valley and I think of Youngstown, I think of, of people that make things. And so what I told them was, and, and, and they get it, they didn't need me to tell them, they're, they're smart people, is you're sitting on the western edge of the largest natural gas field in the world. So while you may not have the production there, you folks, you, you know, you have the means, you have the infrastructure, you know how to build things. So rather than lament about there's no uh, oil and gas under the Youngstown area, you know, take the fact that you're sitting on that cheap natural gas, maybe the cheapest in the world, and attract industry. And they're doing that. They're also doing that down in uh, Marietta. It's called Shale Crescent. And there's a group of business leaders in the Washington County, Ohio area, and they've decided they're not going to wait for government or anybody else to come to their aid down there. They have cheap natural gas. They have uh, the Ohio River, great means of transportation, a lot of rail. And so they've, acted, they've, they've formed an a, uh, organization. And they're going to go all over the world telling those people, or telling industry, come to the Ohio Valley. We have the cheapest natural gas maybe in the world. You folks need to be here. And I, I just, I can't applaud those folks enough for doing that. I think they've, they've, they've got it right. And that'll bleed off. We'll, we'll feel that effect right here in Guernsey County as well if those folks are successful. Just like the cracker plant, even the cracker plant in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, I contend is going to help this area. And if, and if the one in Belmont County goes, you're really going to feel those effects of a cracker plant right here in Guernsey County. So with the, you know, you can see our rig count. We were running almost 2,000 rigs in the United States of America um, for most of this decade. And then look at the, look at the timing end of November or end of uh, 2014 in November, the price collapsed and looks what happens to the rig count. We go from 2,000 rigs down to, uh, at one point we were down to about 500 rigs. Now, I fully believe that that will return once the price of crude oil recovers to somewhere in the 70 to $80 per barrel range. But that's where we're at right now. We've had a, uh, 
a tremendous drawdown in the number of active, you've seen it here in Guernsey County. You used to be able to go over by Seneca Lake, especially in the evenings, you would see one, the lights off of one or two rigs almost any time in 13 and 14. It's had a tremendous, that's what I always try to relay to people is Saudi Arabia uh, and OPEC, halfway across the world, they've, they've made a decision and it's hurting us right here in Guernsey County. We're, we're paying a, 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 a tremendous, uh, uh, we're paying a tremendous price for what they're doing. The domestic oil and gas industry is, is in my opinion, is under attack. So is the boom over? Well, we're going to talk about that. You know, the jury's still out on the untapped oil window, and I'm going to show you a map in a second. Um, we've got over a million acres leased, 33 billion invested, and uh, you know, if you think about it, Mike had to slide. There are 190 wells drilled in Guernsey County. And those were drilled when we were paying $10 million per well. That's $1.9 billion that was invested right here in Guernsey County. I mean, think about that. What other industry has ever come in and spent that much money in, in Guernsey County? Across the state, it brought in at its peak 180,000 jobs. Mike touched on these uh, fire, uh, gas fired uh, electric plants. Potentially, we're going to have one right here in Guernsey County, down below Meadowbrook High School. We've got several new lines coming in. Those lines need to come in because right now we have a bottleneck of, of natural gas in Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And again, that, that's hurting the price. So if you're an oil company, you want, or an oil and gas company, you want those pipelines to be built so you can get your product to market and make a profit. If you're a landowner here in Guernsey County, you want that to happen because um, if you've got a well on your property and your royalty payments are down because the price of natural gas is down, it's very important to those folks that these pipelines get built so we get the prices back up. Mike touched on the ethane crackers. Uh, that's that's going to be huge. The ethane crackers themselves are going to be huge, but I think what people don't, you take it to the next step. Those uh, polyethylene pellets are going to be the feedstock for all different kinds of manufacturing jobs. There's going to be plants built because the ethane cracker plant was built. It's going to have a huge ripple effect um, across our economy. And now, finally, we've been able to do some crude oil exports. So remember when I talked about that oil window? So the yellow is, uh, sorry, the, the, the pink here is dry gas, okay? Pennsylvania, they're doing it. Blast a little bit over into uh, Ohio. And then the wet gas, which comes through uh, eastern Guernsey County. That works a little bit. Dry gas works pretty good right now. Wet gas, well, it's so-so. But look at, look at how much of this is the green. That's the oil window. Right now, as we sit here today, we don't have the technology to unlock the oil that it, it, uh, you know, arguably stretch, stretches over to Coshocton and Holmes County. It's Gingham County. I mean, look, look at this oil window, how it affects us. If we can crack that code and figure that out, think of all the landowners in Guernsey County that would benefit in Muskingum County if we can do that. Uh, my company, David R. Hill Inc., and about six or eight other companies, we're working with uh, Battelle Institute in Columbus. Many of you are familiar with Battelle. And we're actively working right now trying to figure out how to unlock that oil window. And uh, so you think about it, 10 years ago, we didn't know how to drill horizontally. Look how far we've come in 10 years. It's my contention that it'll take time, but ultimately we will, we will crack that code and figure out that oil window. And we do, that's gonna be huge for the state of Ohio and huge for uh, the people of Guernsey County. So, you know, let's, let's talk about the injection wells and, and, the, and the cuttings. There's been a lot of discussion in Guernsey County about what do you do with drill cuttings. So if you think about it, we're drilling a hole 7,000 feet deep, eight inches in diameter. We're drilling down 7,000 feet, and then we may go laterally another 10,000 feet. So you've got an eight inch hole, you're, you're, you're drilling it out in 17 or 18,000 feet. It's a lot of material, it's, it's dirt, it's, 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 it's earth. And so heretofore, what we've done is we, when I was drill a 5,000 foot vertical well, we would, uh, under the direction of the Department of Natural Resources, we would pull off the water and we would bury those cuttings on site. Well, you think now 
these, these 17, 18,000 foot total length wells, it's too much material to build on site or bury on site. So what we've done right now, what we're doing, we're taking them to landfills. So, and then, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about injection wells. But I, I point this out because this young lady, Julie uh, Gunlock, she has nothing to do with oil and gas whatsoever, but she was a young mother. And like everybody else, you want to be the best parent you can, you can, you want to be the best, you know, grandma and grandpa you can. And so she'd done a lot of reading. She was a young mother, had children, done a lot of reading. These parent magazines and all. And what she found was there's always, the, there's always the new scare out there, the new thing you're supposed to be worried about. You know, for, remember when we were all kids, they had uh, diet soft drinks, and they, and they made it sweet with saccharin. Well, saccharin was going to give all of us cancer. And then you found out through the studies that a lab rat would have to eat like a, a train load of saccharin to maybe get cancer. And so it was, it was totally blown out of perspective. Or think about the one where a few years ago it was don't let your kids drink out of a garden hose. My goodness, they're all going to die. Well, think about it yourself. How much water have you ever drank out of a garden hose? We're all still here. So the book is, you know, how the culture of alarmism makes us afraid of everything and how to fight it back. Because she wanted to start fighting it back because she got tired of every time she opened up a magazine, opened up the paper, somebody was trying to scare the living daylights out of her. So, but here's the premise of her book. And think about this. We've seen it happen right here in Guernsey County, and we have to be very careful with this. On any situation, whether it's injection wells or it's what you do with the cuttings or um, just oil and gas drilling in general, if you can install fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you can paralyze people. If you can implant enough fear, uncertainty, or doubt, you can, you can just, people will say, well, let's just not do anything then. Well, no or nothing is not uh, an energy policy. We're better than that. So one of the discussions have been about radiation. And, and this, is, this isn't a Dave Hill or Mike Chazzy fun slide. This was put out by the Ohio Department of Health, right? And it's about radiation. And it's too, it's too small for you folks to read. But from back there. But it puts things in perspective. For example, these are uh, uh, Pico Curies. And a demo X-ray is about a 0.5. Okay? This one is annual radiation dose received by a resident growing their own food and living in a home built on the land with, with 15 meters or 15 feet of overlay on a, on a uh, concentration. Again, the state says we have to be below five picocuries per gram. Uh, radium 226 and 228, less than five. So if you lived on the property and you grew your own food, you get 79. Okay, just remember the number 79. Okay. Smoking one and a half packs of cigarettes a day for a year will get you 3,600 picocuries. 5,000 picocuries is the maximum annual dose uh, permitted if you work in the radiation industry. So all I ask is, because I mean, you say radiation, people think Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and my hair is going to fall out. And all you have to do is say radiation and the argument's over because they've installed fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And all I ask people in Guernsey County is to be deliberative in, in, the, in some of the decisions we make. Just let's think, let's think it through. And so when you talk about injection wells, you talk about producing the oil and gas uh, in general, or you talk about what we're going to do with the cuttings. And, you talk, and so in what we've done in trying to explore and crack the, the code on the uh, oil window. I always like to use this example. Many of you have seen it, probably getting sick of it, but Wright Brothers, 1903, first flight. The guys were from Springfield. They'd done this down in the Carolinas, but they were from right here in Ohio. 1947, Chuck Yeager, two and a half miles south of here from Charleston, West Virginia, 1947, he broke the sound barrier. 1969, Neil Armstrong, we put a man on the moon. In 66 years, in 66 years, we went from that to putting a man on the moon with a slide rule. So I think that, you know, we can safely inject the oil and gas. We can safely encapsulate the cuttings. We can safely drill oil and gas in the United States of America. You know, searching for oil and gas and protecting and preserving the environment are not mutually exclusive concepts. We're smart enough to do both. 
I believe in American exceptionalism. And that concludes my part of the presentation. So we'd be glad to entertain questions. Yeah, so the question is about natural gas exports. And uh, we are now, uh, some of the first shipments of LNG have left the United States uh, for Europe and other destinations. Well, I think maybe one of them ended up in the, an Asian country. So uh, that's being done now. We are exporting natural gas. But let's even pull it back closer to Ohio. Remember I said we've got a bottleneck of natural gas right here in the Appalachian Basin, as we call it now, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Mike talked about those pipelines, the Rover pipeline, the uh, Nexus, Spectra, the Columbia Pipe Group. All of those projects are in various stages of being developed. And this goes back to this fear and uncertainty and doubt issue. Many of those pipeline projects are being slowed, held up or slowed because of uh, this not in my backyard mentality. And, and, and folks, here's what will happen. Uh, some of those um, cracker plants, some of these F, um, uh, plastic companies, if they get too much of that resistance in this part of the United States, you know what they're going to do? Well, they're going to do exactly what they've been doing for the last hundred years. They're going to locate those plants down in the Louisiana area because they've already got a wonderful petrochemical industry down there. They know it. Uh, they, they, they provide good paying jobs, and if we don't stem this not in my backyard mentality, it's going to hurt us right here in Ohio. It's going to hurt the nation if we if we got to get off this, you know, no is an energy policy. Okay, so the question is, um, what do we do to protect ourselves and the environment from the, from the people that aren't inclined to do the right thing? And that's a great question because what you folks should know is that we have a wonderful Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Oil and Gas. You know, in, uh, this goes when people start talking about local control. You don't want local control doing that. God bless our township trustees. They don't have time to uh, um, uh, regulate oil and gas or come out and do that. The Department of Natural Resources, they have hydrologists. They have seismologists. They have all of these people. And so the Department of Natural Resources is out there, um, Division of Oil and Gas, policing our industry. The other thing you should know about that is, um, again, goes to local control. Um, if there's someone out there that is prone to do the wrong thing, and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources says, don't do that, and they continue, he that will have the full force and effect of the Attorney General's office. And I guarantee you, the Attorney General, Mike DeWine, will bear down on those bad actors. And, and as an industry at the Ohio Oil and Gas Association, we welcome that, and we want them to shut down the bad actors because it hurts everybody in this room that's trying to do the right thing. So the question is, at this point in time, does solar energy have the capability to power this nation? Okay, and the answer to that question is no, they don't. Uh, several things about that. I, wish, I have a slide I like to use a lot that the renewables, if you look at our total energy composition, coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear, and the renewables, Renewables are 8% of the energy mix, okay? But that includes uh, solar, wind, biomass. And so solar is like 5% of the 8%. I mean, it's minuscule. It's until we figure out, I'll probably get in trouble with this one, but until we figure out how to store energy, because wind and solar are intermittent, okay? We're a very demanding, spoiled society. We don't want intermittent use of the internet. We don't want intermittent use um, uh, of our uh, iPads and our iPods and our music. You know, we want it on demand, and by golly, if it's not there, somebody's, you know, think about it when the electricity goes out and everybody's blowing up their phone. Hey, my electric's out. You know, I can't live like this. Um, <laughs> and um, so, until you figure out the storage piece Wind and solar are nothing more than curious novelties. Now, there may be a day, because again, I believe in American uh, exceptionalism and technology. That day may come when they figure out storage. But until we get there, it's a fallacy. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big boy. I can take it. Uh, so, you know, Mrs. Clinton has come out and publicly early on said that she was against fracking. And, and uh, she's since walked that back, because I'm sure somebody told her you, you, you would simply uh, hinder our way of life, and not, actually you would, you would hinder national security um, if, if you've if you done that. So, 
So while this November the election will matter, it'll matter more like, like in the Supreme Court picks and things like that. But on the energy front, they can pick on us all they want, but they need us. And uh, while it may be more difficult under one candidate or the other, the oil and gas industry will go on because it's such a vital part uh, of the economy. 100 million solar panels. And, and can you do a calculation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yes, you can do the calculation, but, but I can't do it right here. But it, it can be done. It, it can be done. And um, some of the things that you don't hear, let's talk about solar panels. I got into this really uh, philosophical debate with a bunch of people down in the Athens County area a few years ago because they put solar panels on the roof of the Welcome Center at the Wayne National Forest. Okay? What a wonderful thing that was. Well, and indeed, it wasn't a wonderful thing because I'd done research and they made a mistake of putting meters in there so anybody could go on the internet and see how much energy those solar panels were generating. So I took advantage of that. And I'd done my calculations. And the, based on the amount of energy those solar panels were generating, it would take 25 to 30 years to pay out. I guess that's the good news. The bad news is they wear out in about 15 years. Those things wore out before they paid out. And they, and they did. And so the other thing you don't talk about, solar panels, and I forget the chemical, I should have it memorized, but there is a, a rare earth uh, element used in solar panels. When they do wear out, there is a disposal problem with solar panels. And, it, and nobody's talking about that, but it'll have to be addressed. And the other thing is, to mine that rare earth element, you need bulldozers. And you need things that run on diesel fuel. So they still need us if they still want to make their solar panels. So the question is, um, young people today that, th that think they want to uh, enter the energy industry. Mike, Chadzie, and I, we go around talking to colleges all the time. And, and that's the number one question we're getting on campus is like, especially the seniors. Like, hey, when I started this thing, oil was $140 a barrel and I was looking golden. And now I can't, I can't even get somebody to let me be an intern. So what, I, what we say to them is, I, I'm not going to give uh, a, a, you know, a rosier over glossy analysis of that. But what you have to realize is, and what we have to tell them is, you're entering into a, an industry that is a commodity. In any commodities, they're very cyclical. And it, I mean, I've lived through four of these downturns. Well, I can tell you by far, this is the worst one. It's cyclical. Um, we're always going to need the in, uh, energy. We're about ready to come out of this slump, I hope, and I, I believe we are. Um, we've got, there is um, six billion people on the face of the earth right now, maybe six and a half billion. By 2050, there's gonna be 10 billion people. Where's all that en energy gonna come from? It's gonna have to come from coal, oil, natural gas, and crude oil. And so while that doesn't maybe make your students feel better for the next six months, there is a bright future for energy in the United States of America. So be patient, be resilient, and know that you're, you know, there are going to be ups and downs in the, in the energy field that you're uh, going into. So down in, uh, in West Virginia, WVU is partnered with Ohio State University, and they're looking at um, are there adverse effects on the environment, on the water, and all that. So I know what's going on. I know they're doing a collaborative effort. But I'm not familiar with the results. Maybe you know more about that. But it very, it's very interesting to watch because there, in my opinion, WVU has a, has a wonderful history uh, of energy development through coal, oil, and natural gas. They have great credentials. And who here doesn't love the Ohio State University? And we believe that they're – so now we've got some people that really want to look at this. So I think we ought to watch that study and see how that develops because I, I think we can trust their results. Uh, sure. So the question is – um, about peak oil, and you know, I've, I've been hearing about peak oil since the 70s or 80s. It, it's always, you know, we're going to run out in a few years. And, uh, but again, I go back to technology. When they had peak oil in the 70s and they said we're going to run out, um, we didn't know how to drill horizontally then. And we didn't, we didn't have the technology to go as deep as we're going now. So while it may have been, if, if technology had not changed, and our knowledge of geology had not changed, maybe we would have run out. But we're some of the most innovative people that's ever been on the face of the earth. And so what we've done, we, in, the, in the 80s, a guy named George Mitchell out in Texas figured out how to drill horizontally. And now look what that's done to the production all across the United States and all across the world for that matter. So 
at, at some point, obviously, there is a finite amount, but we haven't even scratched the surface um, of all the oil and gas that's available across the world. And I'll tell you, I'm working on a project right now that we all remember that we've been drilling Clinton Wells horizontal or vertically here since the 60s and all over the state of Ohio. And we've drilled, uh, you've heard of the Berea sand, other shallower sands. Based on the technology we had when we drilled those wells back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, based on the technology we had, those wells, we've done volumetric studies, we've only got about 5% of the oil that was available down there out. The other 95% is still locked up down there. So not only have we, have we found these new wonderful horizons, we're also going to be able to go back into the horizons. We call them legacy horizons, legacy rocks, that were we, because of bad, not bad technology, we just didn't have the technology. It was, it's still on the ground. We just have to now be smart and go figure out how to go back and get the other 95%. We're working on that. My company, I'm literally working on that right now um, to go back into these old fields. So to answer your question, at some point, sometime in the very distant future, it will be exhausted, but we're nowhere close to that at this point. I got to noon if you guys want to keep going. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just want to announce that on October 6th, the next meeting, we're going to have a couple individuals from Armstrong Search Associates and Global Natural Resource Management Company. Um, so that's the next meeting on October 6th, 8 to 9.30. Um, I again want to thank Southgate Hotel, The Learning Jungle for uh, sponsoring the uh, video of this so that we can replay it on local television and Howell Craig for the refreshments this morning. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you October 6th. Learning Jungle on Main Street, formerly Main Street School Supply, is located in downtown Cambridge just west of the courthouse on Wheeling Avenue. They have a huge location full of educational resources and toys that teach, as well as entertain. They feature a large inventory of gifts for children of all ages, and you just have to check out their selection of stuffed animals, puppets, games, and much more. The Learning Jungle on Main Street, downtown Cambridge, has layaway for your convenience and is the area's only specialty toy store. A world of knowledge is waiting for you at their front door.